Are we dumb with money? Let's say it's your payday today, and you saw the balance in the bank account went up. You felt great, so you couldn't resist to go on Amazon a bit. And while you're busy shopping online, you figure it's late already, too lazy to cook. Might as well just get an Uber Eats tonight. A month later, you notice your bank account balance had gone back to square one, and you just couldn't wait until the next payday's here. Does this sound all too familiar? So in this video, I will first talk about five reasons why people are generally not good with money, and then I will talk about the four most common behavioral mistakes that people tend to make with their money but can totally be avoided. Hey, welcome back. This is Thomas here to help Canadians to make better choices on retirement, wealth, and insurance. My goal is to make sure you can take one or two ideas home and start making better financial decisions today. If you find this video useful, consider subscribing so you will never miss any of our videos. Let's jump into it. Before we begin, let's make sure we all understand what this term means: financial quotients (FQ), or sometimes referred as financial intelligence, is a term derived its name from intelligent quotients and is used to describe someone's ability to obtain and manage one's wealth by understanding how money works. Essentially, the goal of this channel is to improve your FQ. Because our traditional education system does not aim to improve it at all. In schools or in universities, we gain knowledge in language, math, science, and etc., and basically on the disciplines that we are interested in. A graduate in bachelor's of computer science will have tons of knowledge on how to write codes, or a med school graduate will have tons of knowledge on how the body works. But even you're in the major of finance, we rarely learn anything on how money works. Although this seems obvious, this is the first reason why most of us are bad with money. If you come out from high school, spend four years in university, by the time that you graduate, you will be in your early twenties. And for those that pursue further education, such as masters, PhD, or math schools, by the time you graduate, you might be in your late twenties or early thirties. Someone with a doctor degree spends so much of their time researching a topic in that discipline, they might be very knowledgeable in that one area. But they may not have much time to learn about how money works. This actually creates a false perception for us that higher education equates higher FQ. In fact, it can be quite the opposite. People with no degree start making money before they turn twenty, while a PhD graduate doesn't start making money until they're almost thirty or even older. Like most things in life, we get better at things that we get repeated exposures and practice on. The earlier someone has to deal with money, the chances are they will get better with money sooner rather than later. And don't be surprised if someone without the degree actually has higher FQ than someone with a PhD. With Canada consistently being one of the most education countries in the world according to the OECD, people in Canada tend to spend longer time in higher education, but not necessarily more means that they have a better financial outcome. What else does more time in higher education lead to? You got it, more debt. According to Statistics Canada, about one in two post-secondary graduates has student debt at graduation. You also might guess it right. The median debt tends to increase with the level of study. College graduates had the lowest median student debt, sitting roughly between eleven thousand to thirteen thousand. While graduates in professional programs such as medicine, dentistry, and law had the highest median student debt at sixty thousand in 2015. FYI, this was roughly three times the amount reported by graduates with a bachelor degree. In a 2018 bankruptcy study, student debts contributed to more than one in six solvencies in Ontario. I know that sounds like a lot of data, but what does all these tell us? That we shouldn't pursue higher education? No, of course not. I have so much respect for doctors and physicians. They are our heroes, especially during this time. All I'm trying to say is, as a fresh graduate with so much financial burden, we need to be smarter with our money. Since it's so common to start off a career in a debt hole, we need to know how to climb out of this debt hole as soon as possible. And for my younger viewers, if you want to learn more about how to get out your current debt situation faster, I suggest you watch one of my previous videos titled "Seven Simple Steps to Retire Early in Canada," in which I talk about the debt snowball method. When was the last time you read a book or learned something new? I know all too well that once we finish school and university, we want to throw away all our textbooks and school notes and just start making money. 
It also doesn't help that our job can be exhausting, so in our free time, we just want to relax. For a lot of people, once their school life is over, they stop learning. But if you want to be good with money, you need to put in the time and effort to learn about it, just like whatever you're good at doing. I'm sure you put in a lot of time and effort to master it. Working with money is no different. Financial quotient is something that can be improved through self-learning, whether it can be reading books, attending seminars, watching trusted YouTube channels, and so forth. Too many of us choose to spend our free time watching all those shows on Netflix or playing video games, but we have to understand that we don't get better with money by spending our time that way. Finally, it's been years since you graduated. You clear all your debts. You climb up your way on the corporate ladder, and you got some money in your bank accounts. You're now what people call the middle class. So now you believe that you need to have certain items in order to show other people that you belong to that class. You then start purchasing a nice apartment, a Mercedes, a Rolex, and so on. Now what? Yes, you have the middle class label, and you continue to stay in the middle class by spending your money on those luxurious branding items. But fortunately, most of these branded items will make you wealthier because they will only depreciate in value. I know it's nice to treat ourselves with our hard-earned money sometimes, and hell, because I've been there myself as well. I just wanted to remind you that the difference between wealthy people and the average people, and yes. That includes a lot of middle-class people. Is that wealthy people tend to spend money on things that will appreciate in value? If you were going to get a Rolex or an LV, make sure it's those one of the limited editions that will only go up in value or at least retain value. Now that we understand why it's so common for us to be bad with money, let's switch it up a bit and talk about some common behavioral mistakes that we tend to make when it comes to spending money. You and I are human beings, and human beings are subjected to making mental and behavioral mistakes. In fact, economists have realized that people tend to make predictable mistakes with their money, and they call this as behavioral economics. A nicer way to say that: how dumb we are with money. Have you ever gotten a concert ticket and someone is willing to pay you twice as much as what you pay for it, but you still refuse to let it go? Or have you ever had a stock with the price going off the roof, but you still refuse to cash out? And in the end, the stock came back down, and all your gains now has been evaporated. If you say yes, then you experience the endowment effect. Basically, it is the feeling of owning something, where the idea of possession increases worth regardless of its objective market value. Retailers and marketers often take advantage of the endowment effect. For example, we are often given a free trial period for a product or service, such that once the free trial period is over and is taken away from us, we are more inclined to pay in order to keep the same product or service. Another example is the use of the return policy. Because most retailers know that once customers bring an item home, a sense of belonging will develop, and customers are less likely to return the item. A second common behavioral mistake that we tend to make is the sunk cost fallacy. A common example is that we pay thirty dollars for a buffet, and most of the time we tend to overeat just to get your money's worth. And take Amazon Prime or Costco for example, because you have to pay for the membership fee per year. Did you purchase more to make your money's worthwhile? Have you ever bought something that you don't really need, but you bought it anyway just because it's fifty percent off? If you have, then you likely experience what we call the transaction utility. Transaction utility is the fancy term that describes the happiness we get from the perceived value of the deal, because we want to feel smart that we bought the item at a good timing. Retailers. Often take advantage of this by marking up the MSRP and then price their goods below the MSRP, giving us a false impression that it's a good deal. If you can learn to refrain yourself from shopping on Black Friday or Boxing Day, and only buy something when you really need it, then you are less likely to fall victims to transaction utility. Last but not least, one of the most common financial mistakes that we make is mental accounting. It refers to the different values a person places on the same amount of money based on subjective angle. For example, let's say there's a fancy dress that costs a thousand dollars, and you dream about buying. You haven't pulled the trigger all these times because you don't think it's worth that much for your hard-earned money. However, one day you won a thousand dollars from the lottery, 
and right away you spend that thousand dollars on the dress. If you are perfectly rational, the dress shouldn't be worth a thousand dollars to you, regardless of how you make that thousand. Mental accounting might be helpful for making monthly budgets and sticking to them, but even then, it could lead us to making irrational decisions. So to avoid this bias, you can allocate money to different accounts. What I did before is to create three accounts: the building accounts, the saving account, and the fund account. I'm allowed to spend the fund account's money, but not able to touch other accounts when I spend it all. Even if I have anything left over, I will donate it. If you can do this, then you should be able to save up more money and avoid spending unnecessary money. Anyway, we cover a lot in this video, but I hope by now you understand why we are prone to make bad decisions with our money. Reaching financial freedom is a long way, but for every dollar that we save, it can turn to two dollars in the near future. Hey, I really truly appreciate that you stay until now. This is Thomas, and I will see you in the next video.